We're going on to topic three of chapter one of math 1127, finite math. And the topic we're going to be dealing with in this section is referred to as linear regressions. And another topic we're going to consider is this concept of mathematical modeling. Now in, in life there are many things that occur in which we get data from it. Uh, you sell tickets, you go to a ball game, uh, there's a certain amount of people, certain amount of prices for tickets. Uh, so as you read your textbook, this will give you some general background. And I just want to go over what they're talking about. So in the particular modeling that we're going to do today, we're using the concept that we went over in the last section, and that is slope. Slope is a rate of change. And as we mentioned before, it's y units in a graph compared to x units, or rise over run. That's what we said slope was. Now, in mathematical modeling, if you find that your data is linear, that is, it makes a straight line, that would be linear. Now, sometimes when you get your data, instead of a straight line, you get like a series of data that are not exactly on the line, but you can approximate it by making a line through the average of the data. And that has to do with regressions that we'll be talking about a little later on in this section. So this is the background. Remember, if you have two sets of ordered pairs, you can figure out the slope. Or if you pick one from here and then one from there, and it more or less fits in there, you could, in a sense, do the average. Now, with the slope, you recall, and the particular equation in which we had y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times x minus x sub 1, with the slope and then one point of data, you can formulate an equation and you could either put it in slope intercept form or convert this to standard form. All right, there's some background. Now, what we're doing in example one is estimating body surface area. If you were a veterinarian and you had to give a dosage of medicine to a animal, sick animal, and it's a great big animal or a rather small animal, you're not going to give the same amount of medicine to each animal. It's good. For the smaller animal it's going to be less. So how do you sort of determine based on what the scientists have developed would, the, would be the appropriate dosage? Well, you would use uh, body surface area. And for this, if you knew the weight of the animal, and you use this formula, A in this case, would result in the estimated body surface area. So, one of the things they're asking here is, what is the significance of this? Well, and by the way, these are in inches squared, square inches. So, analyzing this particular formula, what does this number underlined in red indicate? Well, 
for every additional pound that the animal has, this is the amount of square inches we add to your calculation. So if the animal weighed 10 pounds, you'd put a 10 there, add it to this, and that would be the estimated body surface area. If it was 200 pounds, multiply it by this, add that, and this over the years is what the veterinarians have found gives them a pretty accurate estimate of body surface area. Now I guess initially they didn't know anything about this and then they started to keep records and develop data and then eventually put this data mathematically to develop this formula. Alright, in the second example, and by the way I added something new to this uh, lesson today up over here in blue, I'm putting the page in the textbook that I'm working on. So if you want to go directly to that page and see this, uh, again, more detailed in the textbook, this is just an introduction to it so you get an idea of what's going on. Okay, in example two, they're talking about finding rate of descent. And I think I'll focus in a little more on this. If I had a cameraman, we'd do this automatically. For example two, finding rate of descent. Now suppose you are a um, owner of a plane that could deliver cargo to places where you can't land very readily. There's no landing field, but it needs this cargo, whatever it may be, medical supplies, food. And you can imagine that certain things can be dropped a little bit more quickly, and it wouldn't make any difference, like food or things that are well but delicate instruments, that would have to be uh, handled more carefully. So the size of the parachute would make a lot of difference in how fast something is going down. So you'd want to know what size parachute should you use in delivering this material as you drop it from a plane from a certain altitude. And that's why it's important to finding rates of descent. Depending on the cargo you're going to drop, you need to determine the size of the canopy, the parachute upper part that would slow your descent. Bigger slows it. Smaller, you go faster. Now in this particular case, they're delivering some rather delicate stuff. And the plane is flying at this height, and it's going to drop something. Uh, eventually, in time, it's going to take this long for it to reach the surface. And they want to know what will the rate of descent be, because that hinges on what size canopy you're going to use in your parachute to drop this cargo. And they want it to be about between 14 and 15. Well, again, this is all worked out in your textbook, but I'm trying to give you an idea of what's going on there. And they said, well, first of all, we could figure out what would the slope be. So they give us these two points of data. And notice, as we said in an earlier section, this point happens to be the y-intercept. And this point happens to be the x-intercept. So it was easy to make a graph with my x-intercept there and my y-intercept there. So you see what's going. And you also know that this slope is going to be negative because it's going down. 
Here, these slopes are positive. They're increasing. So we put this into the formula, and we get then A equals our slope, negative 14.4 times T. And since this is already in slope-intercept form, in a sense, our B, we just add it right there. Now, if they didn't give it uh, what B would be, we'd have to use this formula here. Uh, put in our slope, put in one of the points, and that would give you what the B is. So, this particular set of data then supports uh, the size of the canopy that you would use because the rate of descent is 14.4 which is within our category between 14 and 15. As we go on to example 3, and again these are page references from the textbook, uh, there's lots of material to cover. I'll try to give you an idea of what's going to go on. I'm not going to write everything on the board. There are two tables, table one and then later table two. Table one has to deal with round diamonds and this is admiral shape diamonds. Again, I don't know too much about diamonds but uh, that's what that refers to. And anyway, as you look at this Table 1, they give you the number of carats of the diamonds, that's its weight, and then its price. So the smaller the diamond, the less carats, the smaller the price. And then you develop a series of data. We went over this a little bit in a previous lesson. Now, if this is strictly linear, then you're going to get a nice straight line like so. But if you find, as you go up, uh, you know, it's not quite linear, then you could do what is called a scatter plot. And then you take your ruler and you sort of average, as we mentioned before, and draw a line. And that would be what we call the regression line or the best fit line of what's going on. And that's the equation you actually end up with. And then using the mathematical equation of that line that you get from taking the slope, putting it in a point-slope form, and then getting something in slope-intercept form. And I see we're not using standard form here, so we can eliminate that one for now. Now, what do you do then with this data? Well, you can look at this chart, this graph, and just go over to the side and pick out a value. And we call that, when you do that, interpolation. That is, picking it out from known data. Now, every once in a while, we have sometimes we don't have data, but we want to sort of guess in an educated way, and we can extend that if it's following the same trend. And extending it, this is what we call extrapolation, where you are going beyond the known data, and in a sense you are predicting. So all of these things are discussed in your textbook. And for table one, after they take some data, put it into the slope form, then into point slope, you end up with this is the equation for the price of a diamond, which is a certain uh, weight of carat. That is, whatever the diamond weighs. The smaller, 
the price will be less. Larger, the price will be more. Uh, table 2 is just a different type of diamond, and it does basically the same thing. In example four, they're talking about carbon dioxide emissions. And a little background, you may note that carbon dioxide is given off when we burn fossil fuels or any kind of hydrocarbon fuel. And carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that as it builds up in the atmosphere tends to trap the heat and relates to what we are experiencing here, uh, they're calling it climate change. A little uh, ecology lesson is what's the difference between climate and weather? Well, weather is what we experience on a daily basis, the changing in the atmosphere, the raining, the sunny, the clouds. Climate are averages of what you have over periods of time. What is the climate? Again, averages of weather over periods of time. Well, enough said for that. We're looking here at an equation that was developed, again, based on a table, finding slope, and then putting it into the slope uh, point, slope formula, ending up with an equation that's in slope intercept form. Now, sometimes they write it They'll reverse this a little bit. But there's your variable time. And notice what's happening here in terms of carbon dioxide emission. The amount in each year is getting less. Now, it's a tremendous amount, but fortunately it's getting less, and we want to make it even uh, drop down more. So there's what we started back in 1980. We're going to say our time was zero. So our zero point, 1980 is zero. So on a graph, it would look like this. And then they're wondering how many tons of carbon dioxide would be put in the atmosphere as we predict in 2000. Uh, 2118. Okay, not too far from now. Well, actually quite a few years from now. Oh, wait a minute, did I get that right here? I think that's supposed to be a zero. Okay, that's better. Sorry about that. Okay, so we have in a sense 38 years. And we take our 38 years, that would be our time, we substitute there 38, multiply the negative this times 38, we get a number, and that gives us then this number here. 51,800,000 tons. So quite a bit difference from what we were producing back in 1980. But again, that's not the only greenhouse gas, but we'll not go there particularly. As we go on to the last example, uh, you notice there's lots of writing on the board here. I, I tried to keep it to a minimum, but here we're dealing with uh, forestry. And this happens to be one of my areas of expertise. I did a uh, study one summer on the comparison of tree diameters to their uh, crown and the position of one tree to the next. It was kind of a detailed study, won't go into it, but this brings back some memories. One of the things that's interesting in this is this term over here, capital DBH, which refers to the diameter of the tree at breast 
height. Diameter of the tree at breast height. So the thing is, you don't have to reach up or you don't have to go way down to check the diameter. This is sort of a, a general reading that uh, is used in the field of ecology and forestry. Uh, they're also illustrating here linear regression for the heights of a fir tree. And uh, I happen to have this picture right here, and hopefully you can see it. It's uh, similar to this one, but they give the data of what's going on. Now this is a very good scatter diagram. And again, that black line going through there is your best fit. That's called the regression line. And what we're doing here is interpolation. And they're not asking us, except for this last one, to make a prediction. OK. So here is the equation that they came up with, again, using finding slope, uh, point slope form, and then putting it into slope intercept form. And here's a very typical one. So this is our slope. And this is the uh, constant that's out there, our y-intercept, in a sense, where we're starting this. All right, for letter A, they are asking us to interpret what the slope means. Well, for every increase in one inch in diameter, the height of the tree is increased by this amount. This is in feet. So for every inch, one inch, it's 3.8 feet added in height. And that's what that scatter diagram illustrated. And it was, again, an average. And what is the effect of one inch increase in this? Well, again, I think I just mentioned that. It would be this amount of height added to the tree. All right, then they ask, estimate the height of a tree with an eight inch diameter. So what we would do is we'd have our diameter here. We're going to then multiply this by 8, add this to it, and we get the height of the tree would be about 49 feet. Now all of the calculations and all of the uh, computations are done in the textbook. Again, we're trying to summarize and give you an idea of what's going on. And then for letter D, uh, if a tree is 30 feet tall, what can you estimate its diameter to be? So over here, you'd use that same formula, but now we know the height. The height is 30 feet. So we're going to subtract this from both sides, and then divide both sides by 3.8 to isolate the D. And again, they show you this in the textbook, and we find that it's approximately 3 inches in diameter. Okay, that concludes Chapter 1 of what we are to cover in Math 1127. And now it's a matter of you know, practicing and doing the quiz me's, getting some mastery points, and then developing or getting ready for the test.